Is there a reason you're trying to kill me? Yeah, this isn't even the villain of the movie. I'd say we're off to a great start though. This is 2019's The Intruder. Spoiler alert, while I might give you my opinion on the film, that's no substitute for watching it for yourself. Link to the film is in the description. After Scott's friend Mike spoils the surprise that Annie is throwing a surprise party for him, the two of them head up to the suite. Sure enough, Scott acts surprised after everyone pops out. It turns out that the party is due to Scott closing a huge deal, and he is now the number one earner at the company he works for. Later, Scott and Annie spend some alone time and he asks if she still wants to move to Napa to get out of the city. After finding out that she still wants to leave, the two of them take a little road trip to view a house. Once there, they meet Charlie who is shooting deer in in the backyard. After they get scared by the encounter, Charlie takes him on a tour of the house and he seems to connect with Annie throughout the venture. Annie seems in love with the house, but Scott just can't get over how many guns there are and how much old crap is in the house. I don't know, I love old things, they tell a story all their own. As for the guns, Charlie has already established that there is hunting in the area and all I saw were hunting rifles. In an era like that, I think it might be a little harsh to judge someone for having guns like that. If he was in a tiny duplex by the beach in a more crowded area, then I could see a bunch of hunting rifles being a little weird. I'd think it a little weird if he didn't have any guns at all with being out there in the middle of solitude. Once they go upstairs, Scott immediately talks about how he doesn't like the old wallpaper and style, but Charlie mentions that he just figured whoever would buy the house would just make it their own. After they finish the tour, Annie leaves Scott to talk money with Charlie, and after hearing that it's $3.5 million and if he can't afford that, he shouldn't be in the area, Scott decides that he isn't too keen to do business with Charlie. Once Annie and Scott get in the car to leave, Charlie has a change of heart, and he throws in all of the equipment and furniture and takes off $200,000. Charlie explains that he's very particular in who he will let buy the house, and he just really wants them to have the house. Annie is definitely on board, but Scott still isn't too happy. Just roll the window on him? Yeah, rolled up the window on the Bambi killer. I definitely don't like Scott. I know I'm not supposed to be too fond of him, but I really don't like his vibe at all. I'm not the biggest fan of Charlie, but he's in the middle of selling his family home just after he lost his wife to cancer. He gets a little slack. Annie is definitely the only one that I'm rooting for here though. She's a genuine woman that just wants to move forward. Go Annie! After Annie talks to Scott, the deal is struck and they move in within the week. As the movers continue to move boxes inside, Charlie takes a second inside, but he eventually hands off the keys and leaves the new couple to their devices in the house. Once they get back inside, they head straight for the kitchen and they break in the kitchen island. Of all places, I don't think the kitchen island would have been my choice. Not when you've got a backyard like that and a staircase. What do you think? That night, they have their friends come out and we meet Mike's wife, Rachel. Scott tells the story of their first encounter with Charlie and they seem to find it funny like Scott does. After a while, Mike goes to relieve himself and he hears footsteps in the brush. When he doesn't get an answer, he tosses his cigarette down and walks away. The next morning, Mike and Rachel go to leave, but he notices that there is a cigarette burn on his driver's seat. After they leave, Scott and Annie go into town to get some ice cream, and Scott seems to flirt with the cashier. Once they get home, Annie addresses her concern about the way he talked with the woman, and he just says that he was just making friendly conversation with her. The next day, they get a huge surprise while Scott is at work. Charlie is outside cutting the grass. Yeah, I'd say that's a little weird considering he's supposed to be in Florida right about now. I don't see this going well, and it isn't even that bad yet. Annie heads outside to ask Charlie what he's doing, and he mentions that he just stopped by to bring her some numbers to local handymen. He just noticed that they hadn't been keeping up on the yard, and he decided to go ahead and get it done. Later, when Scott gets home, he finds out that Annie actually invited Charlie to Thanksgiving since he's all alone. Sure enough, Charlie shows up with some pies in hand, and Scott gives him a tour of everything they've changed so far. When Charlie notices that the family tapestry has been gotten rid of and some new modern art hangs there instead, he kind of starts to lose it inside. Charlie is none too happy with the changes, but he lays nice for the time being. Soon Mike and Rachel show up for Thanksgiving dinner and there is definitely a difference in opinion between Mike and Charlie. Mike immediately starts talking about breaking down walls and getting rid of all the old original house portions, and Charlie can't help but educate him on how the houses worth living in have integrity. 
Okay, I still don't like Scott, but Mike makes Scott look like a freaking saint by comparison. Mike is openly demeaning and rude to Charlie, and I can't really say he doesn't have something coming his way at this point. Obviously, I'm not saying he should kill him, but I definitely put up a new cigarette burn in his car every time he visits. You know, something just to get him to shut up. Later, Mike goes out to smoke and Charlie shows up to join him. Mike tries to make small talk, but he turns that into a questioning session as he asks if Charlie really has let go of the place. That night, after Charlie leaves, Mike explains his theory of Charlie keeping an eye on them from the woods. He makes a bet with Scott that they'll find evidence of Charlie in the woods right now, and they head out to investigate. After they follow a path for a while, they come to a road where a car is parked. As they shine their lights on it, the driver starts the car and backs away. The following day, Scott's people come out to install cameras on the house, and Charlie pops up to tell the guy to stop drilling holes in his house. I'd say this is more than just letting go of the past. There's probably a screw or two loose here if he's claiming the house like that right in front of the man that paid him $3.3 million. I'd say Scott has earned the right to call it his house now. Charlie tries to make Scott believe that he saw high school kids chilling in the woods the night before, but Scott assures him that he's gonna do whatever he has to do to protect Danny. Charlie tries to tell him to get a gun then, but Scott explains how he lost his brother to a shooting when he was a kid. After this, Charlie leaves. That night, kids set off the motion sensors and Scott runs out with a baseball bat. When he realizes that it was just kids, he goes back inside, but he didn't see Charlie standing there in the trees. Later on, Scott and Annie come home with a Christmas tree, and Charlie is in the shed with a gun. Scott confronts him, and Annie starts to question if he really wants to be there. A couple days later, Charlie shows up again while Annie is decorating, and he tries to explain that he tried to call Scott, but his mailbox is full. Annie feels sorry for him, and she thinks that he means well, so she asks him if he wants to help. I feel like if Annie had just moved there on her own, this whole transition could have been a lot smoother. Obviously, Charlie is really going to lose it here soon, but Scott and Mike are definitely catalysts in this instance. Definitely still Team Annie so far. After Annie gets a text from Scott that says he'll be late because he's working, she decides to call him. The call goes every which way but well, and Annie goes back to having some wine with Charlie. Scott decides that it's best if he just goes back home, and he gets home as Annie cleans up from her dinner with Charlie. Some some dirt comes to the light as Annie mentions that the last time he texted instead of calling, he was with someone romantically, and the two of them call it a night. Later on, the two of them wake up to sounds downstairs, and they come down to investigate. After deciding that it couldn't be Charlie, they apologize for earlier and start to get it on in front of the fireplace. Charlie is just standing there watching them. How can you be so oblivious to your surroundings? He's not even hiding. You couldn't even walk past the dude if you tried to. The next day, Scott goes to get coffee and he meets his neighbor Grady. Grady explains that Charlie's wife actually died by shotgun suicide and Scott decides to look up some details. That night, he mentions everything to Annie and we find out that the DA was going to pursue murder charges. The only thing that stopped them is lack of evidence. Annie tries to point out that that this doesn't make Charlie a murderer, but Scott thinks that he's turning his attention to Annie now. They decide to go into town to have a dinner date, but afterwards, Scott decides to check in on Charlie at the hotel to make sure he's still there. Scott is definitely a little drunk, and he makes it very clear that he doesn't want Charlie coming around ever again. After making a little public scene, Annie takes Scott away, and they leave Charlie at the bar. I will definitely say that Dennis Quaid's performance in this movie is one of the best I've seen him do. He plays the role perfectly, and I'm not entirely sure if that's a comforting thing. The next morning, Scott goes for a morning jog and Charlie runs him off the road. Scott doesn't really see who did it, but he wakes up in the hospital. They determine that there's nothing really wrong with him, but they decide to keep him overnight still. Annie goes home, but Scott calls Mike to explain that he feels like Charlie did it. He asks Mike to get a friend in IT to look up everything possible on Charlie and his family. Back at the house, Annie soaks in the bathtub and she hears the door close downstairs. She throws a robe on to go check, but she gets startled when Charlie knocks on the door. He has brought her a pizza because he heard of Scott being in the hospital, and he compares it to when his wife was in the hospital with cancer. He goes to leave, but Annie invites him in because she is lonely and feels sorry for Charlie. Okay, as much as I'm team Annie for her being the only person that isn't a piece of crap, she's not very smart with all of this. She literally feeds into Charlie's obsession and you can kind of see that she knows what she's doing. Stop! 
Mike comes to visit Scott in the hospital and he tells him about all the charges of tax evasion and whatnot. Scott asks Mike to drive by the house to check on Annie, but when he drives by, he notices that Charlie is inside with Annie. When Charlie goes to get more wine, he spots Mike in the bushes and he chases after him. When Annie calls Scott to tell him about the encounter, Scott is asleep. When Charlie catches up with Mike, he plays nice, but that's a little hard to believe when he's wielding an axe. All I have to do is just get rid of Sky. What the Here we go. This is the part of the movie we've been waiting for. They really played up the is he crazy or not vibe, but we all knew this was coming. When Charlie gets back to Annie, he plays like he twisted his ankle and she takes off his boot to check on him. After determining that he'll be okay, she gets his boot back on and sends him on his way. The next day, Charlie sneaks in the house while Annie is taking a shower, but his peeping session is cut short when Scott calls. Scott gets a ride home and Charlie is waiting for him outside. Scott sends Charlie away and after convincing Annie that Charlie isn't who he says he is, he calls the police to get a restraining order. When Scott asks his IT friend about Charlie's daughter, he finds out that the girl changed her name back when Charlie's wife died. Meanwhile, Charlie is stalking Annie in the house and she's very uneasy when Charlie makes his presence known. Charlie finally shows his crazy. He confesses his love for Annie and there's no going back now. She's pretty smooth in how she handles him, but there's no way anything said or seen can be trusted from here on out. Annie talks him out of the house, but after she locks all the doors and windows downstairs, she hears creaking come from upstairs. When she goes upstairs, she finds a secret entrance that she falls into, and she discovers where Charlie has been living this entire time in the bones of the house. It actually looks pretty cozy, so I'd imagine he could have stayed there for quite a while. But Annie follows the tunnel to see where he's been going in and out of. Considering he just said that he was going to go and clean up, I'd be a little cautious about running into him. He's literally on his way. There's nowhere else he would have gone. When she emerges from the secret entrance, she finds that it comes out in the shed and Charlie spots her. Annie runs back through the tunnel and she runs into the location where Charlie has been keeping Mike's frozen body, and she goes back into the house. She goes to call Scott, but Charlie stops her. He tries to get her to kiss him on the kitchen island, but he ends up knocking her out. What is it about the damn kitchen island? As Scott rides home, Charlie's daughter calls him back and explains how Charlie killed his wife because she was going to divorce him and take the house. Everything is about the house. Charlie takes Annie up to the bedroom, but they are interrupted when Scott comes home. Charlie ties her up and sneaks out into the house. He looks like he could be a crazy Marvel villain. Is Dennis part of the Marvel Universe yet? Charlie ends up tossing Scott over the railing and Annie frees herself during the scuffle. Charlie breaks into the bedroom that Annie was in, but she takes him by surprise. It doesn't do much good, but she gets an A for effort. When Scott finally comes to, he grabs Charlie just in time to keep him from killing Annie. Charlie handles both of them until Annie grabs a knife and stabs him in the back. Charlie stumbles off like a wounded animal and he gets a shotgun from his little room under the house. Charlie sweeps the house with a shotgun and he eventually comes to the room where Annie and Scott are waiting for him. With the swing of a baseball bat, Scott knocks out Charlie and takes his gun. And the credits roll. I can't really say too much bad about the movie, honestly. It's not a standout and the idea has been done before. All in all, the main thing that saved it for me was the performance by the cast. Whether or not their characters were enjoyable or not is not the question. They all brought the characters to light in their own way and I'm honestly impressed with Dennis Quaid's performance. Give it a shot. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more like this one. Comment what you think I should watch next and I'll see you in the next video.